So that's the Flemings and what they're doing with their effluent to sustain this valuable resource. Now let's head down south to the Papawa Equity Partnership to see what they're doing with their worm farm. So we're here in Centrebush in Southland and we're going to be following up on sustainability. And we're going to be catching up with the team at the Papawai Partnership to talk to them about how they're using a worm farm to treat their dairy effluent. Uh, right, so Dallas, um, tell us a bit about the farm. Oh yeah, no, this farm's 213 hectares, uh, James. It's just bounded by two roads and um, yeah, it's all in one block, which is uh, a good thing with the dairy farm. We're going to be milking about 560 cows this year and uh, 238 to 250,000 milk sellers has been the range. So what made you put in the worm farm? Well, uh, I go on a lot of dairy farms in my role and um, I guess I just wasn't quite convinced about the, uh, the big holding ponds and I suppose uh, at heart I'm in a love affair with worm farms. I was aware that uh, at Edendale they had a, a small experimental farm which was processing human and uh, dairy effluent on a small scale. I was well aware of what tiger worms could do because I had owned them and given them to people for about 20 to 25 years and turned all the compost around our veggie garden to soil. So um, they were about the only thing I knew I could employ for nothing and didn't need an employment contract. <laughs> so did you have to get some experts involved? Well, I, I discovered um, a bit of background information ex uh, South America, and that's when I ran into uh, Steve Mace and Max Parkin, who had uh, previously been at the uh, Southland Dairy Company and designed most of the systems there. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another, and I thought there's got to be a pioneer here somewhere. And uh, the Donnellys, who are in partnership with us here, agreed to uh, give it a shot. and. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're very satisfied with progress. This is uh, where it finishes for Matt, and um, it's the beginning of the, um, the, the trip of the effluent treatment um, system. Yep. So you can see all of the, um, the solid material, fecal matter, um, coming off the yard, and from here, down through the grate, uh, gravity fed over to the stone trap, which is the beginning, the first, the first process. From the yard, down um, through a pipe, um, into this um, chamber here, James, which is a stone trap. Okay, so what's happening here is the flow comes from the yard. In simple terms, the stone trap um, is designed just to slow the, um, take the energy out of the water yep. so that any bits of gravel and stones that are picked up by the calves just are settle on the bottom. Settle on the bottom and then we get the effluent running through as you can see there. And that's sort of the first part of the um, solid separation system. Matt will um, clean this out probably twice, twice a year. Yep. And then from there just gravity fed over to the next part of the process which is um, a double sided weeping wall. So from the stone trap, and you can see it just... Usually it'll be pumping out pretty quick out of here. Or... Yes, yeah, un under, under normal sort of... When, when they're CIPing the, the cow shed, there's, there's quite a rate of knots coming through here. But... So you can just see it running um, into this side of the weeping wall. And you can see the solids starting to separate and pressing against the, um, the wall here. So if you have a look at the gaps, the solids hit this. And the solids have also got... Um, there's a lot of weight in there. Okay, so what happens is the weight, weight of the solids, they start to squeeze, squeeze up on themselves and then and forcing the liquid through. And what you'll, what you'll actually see along the weeping wall is you'll see some areas where, it, where, where it's actually weeping through and it might be down there and then that'll block off and then it might start weeping through there. So it's sort of, you know, water always looks for the weakest point and then once it's found that, um, the solids slowly seal the gaps and then it finds the next weakest point. Is this, this is pretty you know, established technology? This, is, this technology's been around for a long, long time. Um, 
And I, you know, I think they're a great system because they're passive. You know, if they're well constructed, um, then really they, they just sit there and do their thing, and, and they don't need a lot of maintenance um, or or um, attention. And that's I, I think that's really important because it, it's 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 minimising risk for farmers and for the environment. So this is um, the leftover from last season. They come in with a digger and um, it sat there for quite a while, so a lot of the moisture's come out of it yep. over a long period of time, so it just all squeezes up and it becomes quite dry, so it's, it's really easy to handle when they um, spin it on, on, onto the paddock. Yep. From the central chamber, you can hear the pump rattling away there. Yep. Um, we pump it over to the, um, to the three tanks that you can see over there. Yep. And the reason that we do that is because um, Matt's milking twice a day, so the total volume that we get out of there daily is about 40,000 litres a day, 40 cubes. But we get that in two bites in the morning and afternoon milking. So we, so we need some equalisation or buffer storage, so that's why we use these tanks here. OK, James, what we have here is the equalisation tanks. So as I mentioned, you've got 40,000 litres a day um, in two chunks. Um, we apply that over a 24-hour period on the biofiltro bed. And here we've got... Um, 90,000 litres of storage. It also provides us um, also with a little bit of additional settling. Um, so we do get some solid settling in the tanks and we've got an automated flush valve which flushes from the tank um, back by gravity um, back into the weeping wall as well. Let's go and have a look at the uh, biofiltro bed, eh? Cool. Okay. Okay, James. Um, so here we are. This is the, uh, the biofiltro bed. So this is the heart and soul of, of, of the system, James. In simple terms, you've seen the effluent spray out of the wobblers. It's applied across the surface of the bed and it filters through. From there, people, people start, you know, when, when they hear worms, they think, oh, it's the worms that are doing all the work. But that's actually not quite right. What happens in the bed, in the media, we've got a whole, um, there's, the, there's a whole living system there's a whole lot of uh, microflora, bacteria, protozoas, nematides, little mushrooms, all sorts of living things. The worms are the top order. So the worms are feasting on all of these um, bacteria in, inside the, uh, the media. The system works because that bacteria require oxygen to survive. So this is an aerobic system. And the worms, as they pass through the sawdust, they create little pathways so they're oxygenating the bed. And so that allows the, the bacteria to grow. Um, and, and it's one of those symbiotic things where um, you know, the, the worms are feeding off the bacteria. But it's the bacteria that are actually um, consuming the, the nutrients and the organic uh, material. So the worm comes along and eats the bacteria. That gets assimilated into the worm body um, at night the worms come to the top of the surface, they defecate, and so after a period of time you get a, a layer of worm hummus. Right. And so all of the nutrients, they don't just disappear, they just come to the top of the bed. Okay. And so that's how it's removed from the liquid stream. So it's just, as I said before, it's, you know, for want of a better, better words, it's nature in a box. It's, it really is quite a neat, intriguing thing. Love it. All natural. It's all natural. Right, so how many worms have we got in here? Um, we don't know. Um, because we don't actually count them, we've actually, <laughs> but it's fair to say there's millions of them, um, and they, they replicate at, at quite a quite a um, fast rate. A, a worm will produce an egg probably about every 30 to 35 days, and inside every egg is you know between 10 and 15 viable little baby worms. Can you have too many in here? No, because it's a self-sustaining population. And the other thing is, um, and it's important for dairy farmers, is that during the dry season, when when they're not milking, and so um, the, the system shut down, there's an alternative food source which is the sawdust. Right. Okay, so it's a, it's a carbon based um, system. Right, so what are the, uh, the, what's the white piping coming out of here too? That, that also just aids um, aeration of the whole system. So under here we've got a false floor and then we've got, just got these tubes um, and then of course you've got all the worms going through um, and just keeping the whole system aerated, really important. You, you have to clean it out and... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, what happens is, and I mentioned before, you get over a period of time a layer of worm hummus, okay? And that's actually really nutrient rich. What you can do is um, you scrape that off, the top maybe 100 to 150 uh, mils. Then you've got this inert, friable, peat-like substance, which is 
you know, you could put a pencil in it and grow a tree, you just know by looking at it, you know, and that can be applied to the land and just ploughed into the land. So you're not losing nutrients, it's just in a different place and a different form. And of course, all of this is about mitigating the risk of um, runoff and um, dairy shed effluent appearing in waterways. So the whole purpose of this is to stop that. Because of course what's coming out of here is treated dairy shed effluent waste, but typically it's got a BOD of less than 50, total suspended solids of less than 50, and faecal coliforms less than 1,000. So, you know, it's sort of, it's getting really quite close to sort of recreational bathing standard. We'll have a look at the discharge, so um, what's been treated um, after it's been through the biofiltro bed, so we'll just open this up, out of there, through the wound basket, because, um, well, Dallas told me he um, would, would be rather upset if he thought that any of them escaped, so he said he's paid for them to work, so they should get back in there, so we just catch them there. So, as you can see, UV chambers, so there's, there's three sets of um, lights going across weirs, because the, the total suspended solids are so low coming out of the bed and the, the liquid has a clarity to it, it lends itself to ultraviolet treatment. So what we do is we just run it over um, some rectangular weirs where we've got about eight mils of, of depth and UV lights above it and um, we just polish off the, uh, the remaining bacteria. And as you can see the, the discharge is, is completely different than uh, what's been applied to the bed. Okay, James, so this, this is the discharge. You can see what's that. Smell that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, there's no, there's no smell to that at all. Right? Nah, that's right. So, there we go. Cheers. So you're pretty happy with the worm farm system and how it's performing? It looks pretty clean and tidy. <laughs> yeah, I can walk in there with my shoes any old day of the week and uh, I can't say that about every effluent system in New Zealand. I've seen all sorts of variations. Um, I, I really like the, the cleanliness, um, the lesser area of land and very, very, very well protected and safe environment. And there's no smell either. I can't smell a thing but I can't say that very often. <laughs> I'm happy today. Um, I look at that pile of humus sitting out behind us. I think by the time we spread that on some paddocks, uh, totally uh, environmentally friendly, full of good balance of nutrients. Um, I like the way the worm bed's working. Look, I'm very confident about it, and I just think it's a way for the future. Well, that's it for the worm farm here in Southland. And our second piece on 